Hello, my name is Jakob Torfing and I'm a professor in politics and institutions at Department of Society and Globalization at Roskilde University in Denmark. I will in this presentation set, up, set out some of the ideas and thoughts that I've developed together with Eva Sorensen in a couple of books. This includes, first of all, our book, Theories of Democratic Network Governance, that were published by Palgrave in 2007. It also includes a more recent book that we have co-authored with Guy Peters and Jean-Pierre, uh, and the book is called Interactive Governance, Advancing the Paradigm, and is published by Oxford University Press in 2012. So the ideas that we will present to you in this presentation is uh, first of all, a bit about the notion of governance networks and their role in society. We will also be talking about the concept of meta-governance uh, and also deal with some of the issues in and around democracy in relation to governance networks. So, I guess the starting point is to note that the whole notion of governance is immensely popular these days. Everybody seems to be talking about governance. And if you do a Google search on the notion of governance, you will see, quite surprisingly, that it's more frequently used than the notion of globalization. Governance, we could define, and we will do so here, as the processes through which society and the economy are steered in accordance with common goals. And in principle, governance can actually be produced in and through different modes of governance. So we can produce governance through hierarchy or markets or, of course, networks. So it, it appears that governance networks are really just a subset of governance, a particular subset of governance that emphasize the interactive aspect of public policy making and service delivery. So in our work, we uh, define the notion of governance networks uh, along many others. Uh, first of all, as involving a stable and horizont horizontal articulation of a variety of interdependent but operationally autonomous actors. This is a key point because the driving force in forming networks is that public and private actors realize that they cannot solve a particular task or problem alone. They need each other, they need to exchange or pull resources, ideas uh, and authority in order to deal with problems and deliver solutions. The second feature of the definition is to, uh, to note that these actors will be interacting through negotiation. And of course negotiation can take many different forms. Sometimes it involves a kind of hard-nosed bargaining where you really uh, give and take uh, in relation to your interest. While at other times ne negotiation is more uh, a deliberation where you assume that you will uh, try to uh, investigate a common problem in order to find a common solution. The third feature of uh, the definition, as you can see, is that uh, these negotiations between the manifold actors uh, take place within a relatively institutionalized framework. Of course, when the actors first come together, there will be no clear rules, norms or values. But when the actors begin to interact with each other, they will gradually develop norms, values, uh, procedures, common uh, forms of knowledge and even social imaginaries that will help uh, uh, the actors to, uh, to uh, uh, interact and negotiate, create a common framework for their interaction. Through these institutionalized negotiations, um, uh, it is possible for the actors to produce uh, a kind of self-regulated policy making. Uh, so that's, I guess, one of the main ideas of networks is actually to lift some of the burden of the shoulders of state and government and produce these kind of self-regulatory uh, arenas where actors come together in order to solve and, and implement public uh, uh, solutions. But it's important to note that the, this kind of self-regulation always takes place, as Fritz Schaaf uh, 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 notes, in the shadow of hierarchy. So there's always a, a shadow cast by hierarchies and governments that are sort of uh, monitoring what is going on in these uh, governance networks and sometimes will try to influence and at least frame what is going on in governance networks.
And finally, we should, uh, of course, uh, uh, note that uh, the whole purpose of governance networks is to produce, produce some kind of public value. But I guess here it's important to, to realize really that, that the output, the public value created by governance networks can be many different things. It can be common values or scenarios or plans, something which is quite sort of, you know, uh, fluffy, but it can also be uh, more concrete uh, decisions and regulations uh, uh, that will affect uh, um, uh, directly uh, citizens, private firms and society at large. So, having presented this uh, definition of uh, governance networks, what we really mean when we use the term governance networks, it's, I think it's also important uh, to uh, raise some uh, cautious remarks. Because there's this whole idea uh, that we are today uh, seeing uh, uh, quite a radical shift from government to governance. And uh, we are not so sure about that, actually. So it's, uh, it's important to, to, uh, to look at some uh, caveats also. So we really, uh, on the one hand, think that governance networks uh, are on the rise, that they tend to proliferate in many different countries at uh, different, in different policy areas and, and also at different levels of governance. For example, there are people who will today talk about the EU, the European Union, as a network polity where network governance is really a key way of, uh, uh, of governing uh, in the European context. However, it should be emphasized that governance networks are not entirely new. What is really new about governance is really how we perceive them. And what is happening here is that there's a tendency in many Western countries at least to, to view governance networks as effective and legitimate uh, mechanisms of governance. And that has changed quite a lot uh, just from the beginning of 70s, where many, for example, politicians would have some doubts about, you know, the inclusion of third parties, interest organizations and so on. But today there's a whole new uh, uh, perception of governance as uh, effective and legitimate mechanisms of governance. Secondly, we should also note that governance networks um, um, uh, clearly pro uh, provide an alternative to hierarchy and markets, but they also uh, provide an essential supplement. So it's not uh, sim so simple uh, that we're just moving from hierarchies and markets to networks. No, we are uh, increasingly uh, coming into an era where we have a coexistence of hierarchy, markets and governance net networks. And that's quite important. So governance networks are both uh, supplanting and supplementing existing forms of governance. And thirdly, uh, we should not uh, buy into the whole idea uh, that governance is the, you know, the final solution, the panacea uh, to everything, uh, but we should really uh, recognize that governance have uh, a particular strength, uh, perhaps in relation to wicked problems. I'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, uh, one of the important discussions in and around uh, governance networks, um, as I just uh, hinted, is the whole notion of, um, of legitimacy and how we perceive governance networks in relation to the production of legitimate governance. And I think just you know, to touch a little on this, because we will come back to it later again, uh, I think it's important to see that, that governance networks can enhance both input legitimacy by involving more actors in policy making and creating better solutions, but also can actually enhance output legitimacy by mobilizing specialized forms of knowledge, facilitating uh, more coordination, positive coordination among actors to prevent uh, overlaps and, 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 and gaps and so on. Uh, and also, uh, importantly, uh, most importantly, build common ownership to new solutions. So this is really important and one of the reasons why there's more and more focus on governance networks, why uh, politicians and uh, central decision decision makers think more and more in terms of organizing governance in terms of networks. They are governing by networks because networks can deliver on legitimacy. Uh, in that sense, governance networks tend to narrow the gap between democracy and effectiveness. We will come back to that in a minute. So, um, as I said before, uh, governance networks is just one among several forms of uh, governance, one of several modes of governance. And we can uh, look at this uh, uh, table here to compare hierarchy, markets and networks with each other. And here it's important uh, to realize, for example, that in terms of coordination, uh, networks differ from hierarchy and market. Hierarchies uh, are really providing a kind of unicentric uh, coordination where there's one key actors, uh, 
actor. Markets are multi-centric in the sense that there are uh, an endless, limitless number of actors in, in a free market economy. Uh, and in network, it's different. They are not one and not uh, an infinite number of actors, but some actors, some actors uh, that are uh, assembled uh, uh, due to uh, their need to uh, exchange and pool resources with each other. And the relation, therefore, between the actors also varies between governance modes. Uh, in hierarchies, we clearly have uh, relations uh, bit, uh, of uh, uh, subordination between uh, principal and agents. In, uh, in markets, we have complete independence. Uh, a particular seller is not dependent on a particular buyer. The buyers can be endlessly substituted with each other. So there's, uh, there are uh, relations of independency. And that's, this again differs from governance network where we have this uh, very important interdependency. The actors, they will need each other and they will need to exchange with each other in order to have access to the kind of resources and ideas and capacities that are necessary to produce uh, uh, governance. Um, the three modes of governance also differ in terms of how decisions are made. Um, in uh, hierarchies, uh, decisions are actually uh, taken by politicians who will uh, take decisions on the basic uh, basis of substantial values and opinions that they are developing. In markets, well, markets are actually blind to values, but, but they will take decisions on the basis of certain procedures that will guarantee free competition. And this again differs from governance networks where we will have decisions made through negotiation. And I think what is particular about governance networks is that everything, both substantial values and opinions, but also procedures and, and, and institutional norms can constantly be renegotiated by the actors. This does not mean that there's a complete flux and chaos in networks because there also uh, comes a certain sedimentation and institutionalization over time. But it just means that everything can be negotiated and brought up in discussion. And it gives a new foundation, a more reflexive foundation for decision making. And in terms of compliance, the difference is that in hierarchies you have legal sanctions, in markets you have economic sanctions, you can go bankrupt if you, if you don't play the economic game. And in networks, the way uh, to get actors to comply with decision is much more uh, something uh, uh, that has to do with trust and obligation. You feel obliged to follow decisions you have been a part of making in the network. So, uh, an important question is then, of course, uh, when are we using these different modes of governance? Uh, so I will basically, or we will argue that there's a choice here that really depends uh, on, a, on, a, on the task or the, the problem at hand. So basically the rule of thumb is that hierarchy will often be preferred where there's uh, an exercise of authority. If you are contemplating removing uh, some kids from their home because of problems in the family, uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, serious exercise of authority. And here we will probably want to, to have some hierarchy because we want rules and also we want to be able to, to place a responsibility and hold certain people to account for the decision they made. Market solutions then are often preferred when governance involves the production of relatively standardized goods and services. And of course the whole discussion becomes what is a standardized service? Is elderly care or a school for children, is that a standardized service? Or is it a complex service that is really hard to privatize or contract out to, to markets? Well, that's a political issue. But that leaves us again with, um, with a whole number of issues uh, and governance networks will often have their uh, strength in solving uh, wicked problems or developing new ideas. Uh, so we have this uh, important notion of wicked problems which are problems that are uh, um, unique, uh, persistent, hard to solve. Uh, we don't know really what's wrong, we need specialized knowledge. Uh, we also uh, need to include various actors and the risk of conflict is relatively large. So in relation to this kind of wicked problems, it has been pointed out persistently in the literature, governance networks have a key strength in bringing together all these actors in order to work on the problem definition and try to find a joint solution to this kind of problem. Well, I guess in, in reality, we also uh, we will often have a combination of these uh, three different modes of governance. Uh, 
uh, for example, in employment policy in Denmark, uh, that's quite a combination both of hierarchy, market solutions, contracting out with local, regional and national uh, governance networks. So what we will often see is the emergence of hybrids where hierarchy, markets and networks are uh, articulated in uh, new and particular forms of governance where it's hard to distinguish where market and hierarchy and networks are beginning and ending. So, uh, I promised that we would also touch on the notion of matter governance, which is a very important notion for us in, in our work and in our research. Uh, and it actually relates to this choice between uh, different governance modes, different modes of governance. Uh, because choosing between or even combining different modes of governance in relation to particular tasks or problems uh, can be seen as a result of what we will call matter governance. Uh, and meta governance we define as the governance of particular modes of governance that produce particular acts of governance. So it's like a third order governance, as Jan Koyman will, will, uh, will call it. Uh, we are governing governance modes in order for the governance mo modes to produce particular acts of governance. So uh, meta governance, you know, the first uh, uh, thing in meta governance is really to make this pragmatic choice of, you know, what kind of governance uh, uh, governance mode are we going to use, or what kind of combination of govern different governance modes are we going to use in relation to solving a problem in a certain sector or policy area. So that's a very very important aspect of meta governance, making this choice. Uh, and there is a choice, uh, so we are beyond those days where we were arguing either in favor of hierarchy or market, we have a, uh, a choice between not two, but three different modes of governance. Um, but what is important in our work is also to see uh, how meta-governance can be used to govern particular governance uh, modes, and for example be used to govern self-governing governance networks, in order of course to improve their performance. So if we have governance networks and if there are performance uh, uh, issues or problems, uh, the idea is to use meta governance to, uh, to try to solve some of these uh, problems and, and, and make governance networks more uh, efficient, democratic, innovative, whatever we want to do uh, with these networks. And here there's a variety of different tools that can be, uh, be used uh, by meta governors. Uh, they can use uh, institutional design, who should be a member of the networks, how should they work. They can also use, secondly, uh, a kind of framing, discursive, political, economic, fiscal framing of networks is an important tool. They can also do uh, process management, mediate conflicts and activate selectively certain actors. And, of course, meta governors can themselves participate in governance networks. So that's the, the fourth tool. So this is an important notion for us. Uh, and just to uh, finish my part of the presentation with a bit about the agenda in the research on governance networks, uh, we have made a distinction in our work between like a first and a second generation of governance network uh, research. And the first generation that sort of began with Hecklow, Hugh Hecklow and a lot in the beginning of the 80s, um, this first generation really studied the widespread use of governance networks in public policy making. So they charted the use of governance networks at many different levels and in different policy areas. They did a very good job, I think. Uh, they also studied the distinctive features of hierarchies uh, uh, of the governance networks vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, hierarchies and markets, a bit what I did before. And also they investigated and studied the qualities of governance networks as mechanisms of public governance. So what is it really in governance networks that can do the trick and produce governance uh, sometimes better than hierarchies and markets? So the second generation from, uh, from the late 90s onwards uh, had a different take on the research and, they raised a, and it raised a new set of pressing questions, I think. First of all, what, what, what are the sources of governance network failure? What is it that causes governance networks to fail and not deliver on results that, that we expect them to, do, to deliver on? Secondly, the question of how it's possible to meta-govern self-regulating governance networks, what I covered also a bit before. And thirdly, uh, what are the democratic problems and potentials of governance networks? And, and here, I guess, uh, they were just like scratching the surface and because this is a really big issue. So, I think where are we to go next? Uh, I, would, uh, I would say that, that first of all, I think that we uh, need to study uh, in governance network research much more the discursive structures uh, 
the kind of discourses that, that help to unify different and conflicting actors around common objectives and joint policy making. I think there's a very uh, important uh, link to, to make in research between uh, the study of uh, the policy discourse and discourses uh, on the one hand and on the other hand governance network and see how uh, discourses help to unify uh, networks but also see how networks uh, are producing discourse. So this is a very important uh, area to study further. Another area uh, for further study is uh, to study more uh, power and uh, the power structures in governance networks that define the political conflicts and cleavages among network actors and take us beyond what I will call the post-political vision uh, that kind of denies the antagonistic character of politics uh, to the detriment of democracy. So I, uh, we, we, we tend to think or believe that, that, that this whole managerialism in new public management that came with new public management has kind of de depoliticized governance uh, and also depoliticized the uh, governance networks so that we are uh, not really uh, seeing governance networks as a part of, of democracy. So, so that could be an important uh, thing to study. We'll come back to that also. Thirdly, um, I think uh, there's a tendency to, to look at the governance networks uh, mainly in terms of structure and maybe we, we, we need to go more into the, the actual processes in network arenas and actually study collaboration and study how collaboration for example can help us on a very important uh, uh, agenda today namely policy innovation. Uh, so we have a cross pressure in the public sector today with rising expectations from citizens to welfare uh, to the quality and, and, and amount of welfare that they can receive. And on the other hand, we have scarce and limited public resources due to the fiscal crisis. So in order to, uh, uh, to get out of this impasse, we, uh, we need to produce more uh, clever, smart, innovative solutions and collaboration is a key mechanism for spurring innovation. It is very often when, when we bring together different actors, when they disturb each other way of thinking, when they have joint learning processes and, and build ownership to new bold ideas, that we really innovate uh, public policies and public services. And last but not least, uh, we believe that, that we need to do much more in terms of studying the democratic uh, implications of uh, democracy because as I said before we've only been scratching the surface and we think actually this is a, a, a huge area uh, for uh, governance network researchers to explore, explore in the years to come. But I will leave that to Ivar Sorensen uh, who is a specialist in, in uh, making this link between democracy and governance network. Thank you. Hello, my name is Eva Sorensen. I'm a professor uh, in democracy and public administration at Ruskele University. And I will try to take up from where Jacob uh, ended and try to look at the particular democratic problems and merits of governance networks, which is one of the discussions that we've been engaged in for some time now. And uh, the task is still a huge task is still ahead of us to try to uh, get into depth with this problematic. First, I would like to focus on the democratic problems related to the use of governance networks in, in governance processes. And these problems really spring from the inherent need uh, for autonomy of these governance networks. As Jacob pointed out, that uh, really the what driving force of these networks is the collaboration uh, the, between interdependent actors that have enjoy some uh, a particular degree of autonomy and that's a crucial aspect for governance networks to function that they face this kind of autonomy so that is actually one of the problems that is uh, serious for us when we discuss the democratic impact of governance networks furthermore also uh, governance networks tends to blur the, dis the, the distinction between what are pro public, public actors and what are private actors. And by blurring this distinction, they actually try uh, end up um, challenging some of the basic features of what our way we think about democracy as something that actually calls for a divide between the public and the private. So, uh, and that comes out in at least three ways in relation to the input side, the throughput, and also the output side of the democratic system and the democratic process. Um, with relation to the input side and, and, uh, of democracy and our, the way democracy produces input legitim legitimacy. 
It is in governance networks difficult to ensure the democratic inclusion of all the relevant and affected actors, really. Like in, in a representative democracy, this uh, um, inclusion is ensured through general elections and so on. But who are really, what are the criteria for gaining access to a governance network and, and actually also to get some influence through that participation? The second problem has very much to do with throughput, where the in, uh, access to governance networks is related to what um, Irene Marion Young has called, talked about as ex uh, external ex inclusion. Uh, the, the second part here is related to the question of internal exclusion. That is, how do we ensure that those who are actually gaining access or have become, uh, become a part of a governance network is actually gaining influence because the degree to which they ga have the possibility of gaining influence when they are in a network tends to re, uh, depend very much on the degree to which other parties are, are dependent on them. And uh, so there are often asymmetries within these governance networks depending on the resources the different actors who are participating in the networks have. And that might raise uh, questions of equality and so on within the networks. Thirdly, a question has been raised about the problems of ensuring accountability in governance networks. And this problem is, of course, very related to the fact that governance networks are also often characterized by a low degree of formality and also a tendency to have a low degree of transparency uh, and uh, that they uh, are able to escape publicity and so on. So how can we really ensure that the decisions and policy making that goes on in governance networks are made subject to accountability, that those networks are actually in, in a situation where they must give narrative accounts. And that question about accountability is, of course, a key feature of uh, democracy. But there are also, despite all these problems, also some very uh, important uh, contributions or potentials of governance networks. And that has been described in a lot of contributions in the governance network research and literature, which is also highlighted in some of the newer theories of, of democracy, uh, pointed out by uh, researchers like Paul Hurst and uh, Akon Fung and, and others. And, um, what is, is, is underlined here is that governance networks, they actually uh, give a positive contribution or supplement, as Jakob uh, voiced it, to representative democracy because they tend to uh, give more and, and uh, supplementary uh, channels of inf influence to the particularly and intensely affected actors. But one could say that representative democracies tends to give few, few uh, open, give few opportunities to participate active in the day in in, uh, in democracy in everyday life. And uh, what governance networks do is that they actually offer a lot of um, other ways of actually taking more direct part in decision making in the political system. And uh, first of all. This gives the particularly affected actors an important extra influence challenge. And by doing, by, by, by doing that, you can say that we, there's a chance that, good chance that governance networks will actually end up uh, enhancing the input legitimacy of the political system by giving these actors who are particularly affected by a certain uh, decisions made in the political system and extra access to actually directly participate in the decisions made in this area. Secondly, the uh, governance networks tends to allow for a much more direct and focused communication between those who are directly affected by a decision, the sub-elites who are take part in uh, trying to deal with this problem and also the political elites are like in politicians and so on. And this dialogue can actually uh, increase the in with input legitimacy of the political system to a great extent uh, in relation to debates about certain t subject matters, for example, the more problem-driven forms of collaboration between citizens and sub-elites and elites. Finally, you can also say that 
uh, governance networks has the potential to enhance the output legitimacy of the political system because by inviting actors into uh, more directly into processes of policy making, decision making, uh, implementation of different policies, you actually tend to extend the, uh, a, m a number of actors who actually feel an ownership to these policies. And that can be extremely important also if these actors are actually going to implement or are or, or, or important for actually bringing these governance outcomes out into the open and uh, realizing these governance outcomes. So in that sense, there's a plus and a minus with governance networks in relation to democracy. One of the democratic theories, recent democratic theories, who are really try to address this question about the democratic aspects of governance networks is Mark Warren. He has actually introduced a very catchy title or uh, concept called governance-driven demo governance -driven democratization, which is, I think, catching something very, very interesting and something very, very important. What he's pointing out is basically that what we see today is actually that this kind of more uh, um, participatory form of democracy that we see that governance networks also bring about is actually not so much driven by um, efforts to enhance democracy as they are uh, a pro product of uh, efforts to produce what we could ca call policy execution or the capacity actually to solve the, the very difficult governance tasks that we face. And that's why I call it governance-driven innovation. It's the, it's the ambition of producing more effic effic efficient and effective governance that actually drive us towards democratization in the sense that we uh, move towards a more uh, participatory form of governance that includes or involves the larger citizenry in and also different interest organizations in producing governance solutions. Governance, uh, Mark Warren, he points to four different characteristics of what he calls governance-driven uh, de democratization. First of all, he points out that this movement towards uh, governance-driven uh, innovation, uh, governance-driven um, democratization is um, a, a result or has gained speed because of what we could call uh, the democratic disenchantment of representative democracies. The, demo democratic, uh, the representative democracies in today's world is as actually suffering uh, heavy criticisms these days because, uh, the, because of the lack of efficiency of, the of decision making, because of the increasing distance between policymakers uh, and uh, citizens and so on, and also the whole media-born political uh, 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 debate and so on, that it actually has produced uh, what you could call a disenchantment, a de uh, declining belief in the political system in many uh, Western uh, representative democracies. And you can see this process of governance-driven democratization as a way of mending this problem. Um, Furthermore, and that, I think that's the, maybe the most important uh, aspect of um, Mark Warren's thinking, is that he actually points out that instead of being, uh, of preventing democratization, you see actually public administrators as some of the leading uh, figures in promoting this kind of governance-driven democratization, because they see that, uh, that we need actually to engage citizens different stakeholder groups more, much more actively in democratic, in decision-making processes if we are to produce solutions to wicked problems. So the driving forces are not so much political actors as it is actually uh, public administrators and others, um, uh, other administrators who want uh, things to get be done, who, who wants to uh, solve governance problems, who are actually driving forces in producing democratic uh, uh, democratic developments and so on. Um, and these processes, and that's noteworthy, no, noteworthy of, of trying to democratize uh, governance uh, through, by the, through the use of governance networks is not really linked to uh, representative democracy. You see actually a kind of decoupling between the decisions, the activities, the efforts to govern that are taken more or take 
are coming out of representative democracy on the one side, and then all these efforts to try to solve governance problems through all kinds of network-like processes where you involve the larger society. These processes are, are basically linked, uh, linked, delinked from each other. And that is ob obvious a, a matter of much concern and how can we actually see these two elements or aspects of governance today, what are their linkages and so on. Finally, what, the governor, uh, what Mark Warren offers is actually a new understanding of the demos, as he says. What he points out that if we should try to understand the term demos in relate, that is, the, who are the public, who is the society, and who should be heard, who should be included in governance processes, what we need actually to, to discuss is uh, whether citizenship is actually the main, the most important way of looking at who should be included and not be included. In relation to governance network, what seems to be more important and what should be considered more is the level of effectiveness. Pointing out that in governance, in relation to governance networks, we need to think in terms of effectiveness rather than uh, whether you are belonging to a ter territorially defined citizenship when you discuss who should be in included and who should not be included in different network processes. Mark Warren, he points to different, different barriers to, uh, um, to, coll to this form of uh, governance-driven democratization. Uh, you can say that what, what, we, what you could say is that how do we, when, when these processes are driven by administrating elites who are particularly mostly interested in solving pressing policy problems, who are actually being participating in deep pro de these processes. They are not, when you not, do not approach this uh, discussion from a strictly democratic approach or from democratic theory, it becomes less interesting whether we actually have all the right people included and so on. It's more important that we get th those included that are actually going to important for uh, producing governance outcomes, efficient governance outcomes. So there could be a participation problem here. Do we also get the weaker actors into the process and so on? Secondly, there's also the problem of what the degree to which those who are included in the process will actually get influence. Is this only, you know, a kind of including people to satisfy people, whereas putting several barriers up to their actually getting influence in the different processes. This is one of the big issues that we're discussing. To what extent does uh, influence and participation go side by side or go, go hand in hand in governance networks? Finally, one of the big criticisms that can be raised against governance driven democratization is actually that it seems to uh, address or address the whole question about governance and governance network in a depoliticized manner. It tend, because the focus becomes on, uh, or focus, the focus becomes to get things done, to solve problems and so on, the whole way of framing, the discursive framing of the, the process, and also because managers seem to be, be leading figures in, 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 in spurring governance driven democratization, um, the, the, uh, the, the whole way of approaching the question is depolitization and it reduces or puts focus away from questions about who are getting what, where and when, and what are the power games be between different actors and what are actually the battles that are going on in governance networks. Uh, Jakob and I have for several years tried to get politics back into the discussion about governance networks uh, and thereby also to drink, uh, stressing the need to democratize governance networks. We have in an article from 2005, among other things, and later tried to develop it, uh, developed a, a, an approach that we call the democratic anchorage of governance networks. Um, this approach takes departure from the fact that governance networks might have democratic effects, but not that they necessarily will have so. Uh, because governance networks are not necessarily democratic themselves. So the whole issue that we've been discussing is really how do you ensure that, democratic, that, that governance networks become democratic in themselves. 
And whether they are so or not is basically very, uh, a matter of empirical investigation. Therefore, also, we have done a lot of studies, and I'm, we are very glad that several others have also taken up the task of trying to measure, make empirical measurements of the democratic anchorage of different governance networks. And what these uh, research results actually show is that there are huge varieties between different networks. You find governance networks that are actually you could be, say, really democratic and other networks that are not. And that has also to do with the extent to which they are discursivized or seen as, uh, uh, as arenas for political decision making or whether they are seen as managerial, strictly managerial arenas for getting things done. But what we have tried to do is set out a, a research scheme or a method or a framework a model for um, uh, measuring the uh, democratic impact of different governance networks. And that is what we call the model for the democratic anchorage of governance networks. Um, on, in this model, we claim that governance networks are democratically anchored as, if they are living up or are, are anchored by four different anchorage points, you could call it. The first one is actually the link to the uh, representative democracy, that we need to establish a link between representative democracy, more de precisely politicians, and governance networks. And what we point out here is that we need governance networks to be meter governed by politicians. That's the first anchorage point. The second anchorage point is um, that we actually need n uh, networks to be representative to the participating groups and organizations. That we actually need a, re a representation relationship between those people who, are who participate in governance networks and the actors that they actually represent, or the groups and the organizations that they represent. Thirdly, what we need to do is to anchor network uh, governance networks in a democratic prop, uh, public that scrutinizes the activities and calls upon the networks to give democratic accounts of what they're doing. And finally, we need governance networks to actually be regul regulated internally by what we could call the democratic grammar of conduct. Uh, we are working right now on, now on trying to develop and, uh, and specify more what could be meant by a democratic grammar of conduct. But this is basically something to do with, for example, the uh, question of a democratic ethics, the uh, 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 agonistic ethics, like in, in line with what uh, Chantal Mouffe and others have pointed out. But also, and that is also very important to say that an ethic is not enough to ensure democratic uh, uh, pro pro procedures and inclusion within governance networks. What we also need is actually to talk of soft forms of institutionalization in, forms of, in terms of developing routines, norms, um, uh, different kinds of, of, of other ways of practices, routinized practices and uh, uh, so on in order to ensure and meet the logics of appropriateness and so on that makes it natural to act in a certain way, democratic way within governance networks. Uh, question is, as we have pointed out, uh, as Jaga pointed out, governance network can contribute to making public governance more effective. That is actually have, have been one of the main ambitions of uh, of uh, Governance, early governance network research to point out how governance networks are actually surfacing and, and uh, uh, blooming and mushrooming because they have the capacity to enhance the effectiveness of public governance. As we have seen, and I think some of our research has shown, uh, governance network can also at the same time democratize society and provide new democratic arenas. So basically what we're saying here is that the relationship between effective, efficient and effective governance on the one hand and democracy on the other hand is not necessarily a trade-off uh, as some have suggested. What we try to argue here is actually that a plus some gain between democracy and effectiveness and efficiency is possible by the using governance networks, if they are meter governed in the right way and so on. Um, but there is one key obstacle as we see it as uh, how is it looking out there. And I would say one key obstacle of 
uh, of actually reaching this kind of plus sum game that we see, uh, that we want to to reach is uh, um, the very idea that you see very very strongly not least in, the, in in and around the EU but also by other researchers but you know like the idea that uh, of the regulatory state the idea it is in, in the EU discussion uh, exemplified very much with the word or work of Majone, uh, who, who are actually viewing all these governance processes and get things done thing as a matter of a regulatory state that does not need democratic legitimacy, that does not need to be anchored and to be accountable and so on, because it's simply a matter of uh, a technical procedure, it's of regulating things and there is no politics in regulation. So, and this is one of, the, I think, the basic obstacles that we are facing right now is that we actually try to wind up the whole discussion about networks and so on in a non-political or depolitical uh, uh, rhetoric. And that is a huge problem. Also because this kind of argument, this kind of approach seems to suggest that the only way, the only kind of legitimacy a governance network needs is actually uh, output legitimacy. That if it produces outcomes, then it, it, it is uh, legitimate, uh, which we see very much. And that kind of le legitimacy you obtain if you actually are able to produce eff efficient and effective outcomes. And, and what we want to insist, really, is that Input legitimacy is, is central to democratic, uh, to network governance, not only to enhance democracy, to ensure democracy, but also in the long run to produce efficient outcomes. We think it's not enough for governance networks, if they are to be democratic, if they are to be efficient, to live out of, of in, uh, output legit legitimacy. That is a very dangerous road to take, and it also seems to deviate from the point that what goes on in many of the governance networks that have been studied by the whole large uh, group of governance researchers point out that a lot of politics is actually going on in these networks. So we should, we should insist simply that governance networks should live up to that democratic criteria of in on the input side, on the throughput side, and also that they should be made accountable to the larger citizenry and so on. So, but how this should be done, how we are going to progress in setting up standards for how we can democratize uh, governance networks, there's still a lot of work to be done. And we want you all hope a lot of researchers and others will actually join us in the, in the search for new ways of pointing out the criteria for enhancing the democratic quality of governance network. Thank you. <laughs>